Mr. Chairman, sir, distinguished audience. At the outset, let me thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak from this platform. My subject is measurement of blood pressure and its implications. This is the first measurement of blood pressure in an animal. Stephen Hale, in the year 1733, inserted a brass cannula into the carotids of a horse and it was observed that the blood raises in the glass tube under pressure. So we all know the definition, the force exerted by the blood against the blood vessel wall, the highest being the systolic and the lowest being the diastolic. Blood pressure measurement is often considered routine and is often performed by those with list training. And here comes a bombshell. It is uh, published in the Hypertension as a Companion to Brownwell's Heart Disease, edited by Black and Ely at 2013. Neither the beginning medical students who claim to have learned proper BP measurement technique, nor practicing nurses in Australia or Taiwan, nor physicians in India, nor general practitioners in Newfoundland had sufficient knowledge to pass a standardized test regarding correct technique in BP measurement. And this is evidence-based. This is based on a few studies. See what happens if there is a small error in BP measurement. This is the cutoff point of the diastolic blood pressure in the American population, 90 millimeter. This part is hypertensive. If there was an error of 5 millimeter mercury plus, in that case, 27 million people would have been stamped as hypertensive. These are the different sources of error in BP measurement, conversation with the observer, no rest period, AFib, white coat effect, alcohol, caffeine, smoking, full bladder and bowel, crossed legs, Corot cups fourth, taking as the diastolic blood pressure, digit preference, etc. I will discuss this under four headings. BP measuring methods, recording at clinic, spatial issues, and spatial situations. BP may be me measured by auscultatory method, oscillometric method, finger cuff method of penes, ultrasound technique, and tonometry. The last three, since they are not routinely used, I will not discuss them. I will just confine to the first two. Corot cups method is still the key method. We all know about the five phases, phase one being the systolic and phase five being the diastolic. Phase four we consider as diastolic in exceptional situations where we can hear the corot cup sounds down to zero. Limitations is systolic blood pressure is underestimated and the diastolic blood pressure is overestimated by this method if we compare it with intra-arterial records and auscultatory gap should be kept in mind. This mercury sphygmomanometer is considered to be the gold standard. This measures the blood pressure directly by observing the height of the column. Errors of calibration cannot occur unless the markings are wrong and this has been used in most of the clinical trials because of their accuracy. Aneroid sphygmomanometers, the pressure is registered by a mechanical system of metal billows that expands as the cuff pressure increases and a series of levers that register the pressure on a circular scale. It loses its stability over time and particularly if it is handled roughly. It is inherently less accurate than mercury and accuracy varies from manufacturer to manufacturer and this needs to be validated every six months ideally. Coming to the oscillometric technique, the principle is when oscillations of the pressure in a sphygmomanometer cuff are recorded during the gradual deflation, the point of maximum oscillation corresponds to the mean intraarterial pressure. By this technique, we assess the mean pressure and we cannot directly assess the systolic or the diastolic pressures which are derived by, it, by an empiric calculation. It can be used in noisy environments, that is the advantage, but they are not designed 
to be used in arteriosclerosis, in irregular arrhythmias, preeclampsia, pulses alternances, pulses paradoxes. Blood pressure readings differ from those determined by auscultation and vary subject to many factors like pulse pressure, heart rate and arterial stiffness. So this method again needs to be validated with a sphygmomanometer. How to validate them? Using a white tube, putting in the pressure, pressure and one needs to compare the aneroid with the mercury column. For an aneroid to be used, its error should be plus maximum plus minus three. If it is more than that, it should not be used. So also the electronic device should be validated and calibrated with a Spigmo manometer. Some hybrid Spigmo manometers are coming up, which combines the features of both electronic and the auscultatory device. Here, the mercury column is replaced by an electronic pressure gauge, such as used in oscillometric devices. This hybrid manometer has the potential to become a replacement for the mercury because it combines some of the best features of both mercury and the electronic devices. Coming to the recording at the clinic, three issues, subject preparation, device preparation, and the recording proper. Factors which affect the blood pressure recording, I have already mentioned some of them. Room temperature, exercise, alcohol or nicotine consumption, positioning of the arm, muscle tension, bladder distension, talking and background noise. It should be measured in a quiet, private, comfortable environment with good lighting. Patients should be sitting on a chair. But here lies a differ basic difference. The American guidelines and the, in the Americans, they measure it in a sitting posture. But in most of the part of Europe, it is done in the recumbent posture. And there is a positional difference between these two postures. Sit, sitting in a chair with a back, backrest, one should not be sitting on an examination table without any backrest, because in that case, they, there will be an error. Feet should be flat on the floor. Legs should not be crossed. Patients should not talk prior to or during the procedure. Arms should be supported at heart level. That is, the fourth intercostal space is considered to be the center of the right atrium. The patient should be asked to remove all clothing that covers the location of the cuff placement and procedure should be explained. Caffeine, exercise and smoking should be avoided for at least 30 minutes prior to the measurement. Patients should be seated quietly for at least five minutes before one measures the blood pressure. And at the initial visit, BP should be measured in both the arms. Let us come to the effect of different body position. DBP measured while sitting is higher than when measured in the supine position by about 5 mm of mercury. When the arm position is meticulously adjusted so that a cuff is at the level of the right atrium, so SBP has been reported to be 8 mm higher in the supine posture than in the upright posture. When measurements are taken in the supine position, arm should be supported with a pillow. If the back is not supported, DBP may increase by 6 mm. Crossing of the legs may raise the systolic pressure by 2 to 8 mm. Talking may raise the SBP by 10 mm and listening may raise by 5 mm. Coming to the effect of arm position, if the upper arm is below the level of the right atrium, that is when the arm is hanging down while in the sitting posture, the reading will be too high. Similarly, if the arm is above the heart level, the reading will be too low. These differences can be attributed by the effects of hydrostatic pressure, and it is around 2 mm mercury for every inch above or below the heart level. Several studies have shown that the blood pressure measured in both the arms may be little different. Almost all have reported finding differences, but there is no clear pattern. So the, the usual conception that it is higher with the right arm is probably not true. 
Nevertheless, it is recommended that blood pressure should be checked in both the arms at the first examination and when there is a consistent interarm difference, arm with a higher pressure should be used. Exception is, if for a screening purpose, if one measurement has to be done, it has to be done in the right arm. Coming to the device selection, gold standard remains the mercury sphygmomanometer, but these are being removed from clinical practice because of environmental concerns about mercury contamination. It is recommended, if available, a properly maintained mercury sphygmomanometer should be used for routine office measurements. Mercury manometers are critical for evaluating accuracy of any type of non-mercury device. But that is another very important issue. A trained human using a mercury manometer is still the gold standard and the overwhelming majority of our clinical trial database is based on that method. Hence, as a disciple of evidence-based medicine, I think we should insist on a mercury sphygmomanometer rather than accepting anything else. These are available small, regular and large and a 12 to 15 inch of stethoscope tubing is recommended having both bell and the diaphragm. It has been demonstrated that most frequent error in measuring blood pressure in the outpatient clinic is miscuffing with undercuffing large arms accounting for 84% of the miscuffings. The ideal cuff should have a bladder length that is at least 80% and the width at least 40% of the mid-arm circumference. Length width ratio 2 is to 1. These are the different cup sizes for recommended for different arm circumference, circumferences. The observer must first palpate the brachial and place the midline of the bladder of the cuff commonly marked so that it is over the arterial pulsation and over the patient's bare upper arm. The lower end of the cuff should be 2 to 3 centimeter above the antecubital fascia to allow room for placement of the stetho. The cuff is then pulled snugly around the bare upper arm. Neither the observer nor the patient should talk during the measurement. I have already highlighted this issue. Phase 1 and phase 5 should be considered and it is best heard using the bell of the stethoscope over the palpated brachial artery and not by the diaphragm because these sounds are low frequency sounds. Obtain the palpatory or estimated systolic pressure by palpating the radial pulse obliteration. Inflate quickly 20 to 30 millimeter above. Deflate slowly at the rate of 2 to 3 millimeter per second. SBP is the point when the first of two or more correct cough sounds is heard. Disappearance is the diastolic blood pressure and it should be repeated after an interval of one minute, not before that. It is well recognized that the predictive power of multiple BP determination is much greater than a single office reading. When a series of reading is taken, the first is typically the highest. A minimum of two readings should be taken at intervals of at least one minute and the average of these readings should be used to represent the patient's blood pressure. If there is a five millimeter mercury difference between the first and the second, additional one or two readings to be taken and averaged. In some scenarios where the current cup sounds are very faint, one can open and close the fist five times after the inflation of the cuff to augment the sound. Another technique is raise the hand, keep it for a, for a while, then inflate the cuff and auscultate. The sounds may be, will be louder. First and the second things may be combined to further augment the sounds. What is the observer requirements? Eye, a very close coordination of eye, ear, brain and hand is absolutely essential for a proper and accurate measurement of the blood pressure. There are a few special issues I like to discuss. Ambulatory monitoring, home blood pressure monitoring, white coat hypertension, mast hypertension, orthostatic hypotension and pseudo hypotension. BP has a reproducible circadian profile with highest value during the awake hours and lowest during sleep. White coat effect 
is noted in as many as 20 to 35 percent of the patients diagnosed as hypertension. ABPM, these devices use either a microphone or to measure the correct cough sounds or, or a cuff that senses the arterial waves using the oscillometric techniques. Ensure that at least two measurements per hour are taken during the usual waking hours. And use the average of at least 14 measurements during the patient's, during the person's usual waking hours should be taken to confirm the diagnosis of hypertension. The NICE guideline recently, they have incorporated this measurement of ambulatory or home blood pressure assessment for confirmation in stage 1 and stage 2 hypertension. In stage 3, it is not required. However, JNC7 did not mention about the confirming hypertension by ambulatory or home blood pressure. These are the areas where JNC7 recommended that ambulatory blood pressure monitoring is helpful. Ambulatory values are lower than the clinic values. Awake hypertensive individuals have an average blood pressure above 135 above 85 by 85. And during sleep, it is more than 120 by 75. The level of BP measurement using ambulatory blood pressure monitoring correlates better than office measurement with target organ injury. And ABPM also provides a measure of percentage of the BP reading that is above normal. It sets out the four nocturnal patterns of blood pressure. Extreme dippers where the dip is more than 20%. Dippers where the dip is between 10 to 20%. Non-dippers dip is less than 10%. And reverse dipper or rises where there is a rise in the blood pressure at night. This is the average systolic blood pressure what is considered. This slide shows that there is a, a J-shaped relationship between the dipping status and the stroke incidence, the highest being in reverse dippers and extreme dippers. Home blood pressure monitoring has again a set pattern for that. One, if one needs to confirm the diagnosis of hypertension, one should ensure for each blood pressure recording two consecutive measurements are taken at least one minute apart with the person seated and the blood pressure is recorded twice daily, ideally in the morning and the evening, and BP recording continues for at least four days, preferably seven days. First day's record should be discarded and the average of the rest of the records should be considered as his blood pressure. This is a very tedious and time-taking procedure. White coat hypertension, we are all aware of. During the medical contact, there is a rise in the blood pressure, but out of office, blood pressures are normal. Their risk is intermediate between true hypertensives and those who are normotensives. Masked hypertension is just the reverse of white coat hypertension. Here, in the office, the reading is normal, but during the activity and out of office, reading is elevated it can affect more than 10% of the patients. It clearly increases the cardiovascular risk. Orthostatic hypotension is defined as a drop of 20 millimeter mercury systolic and 10 millimeter diastolic within three minutes of standing. It can be asymptomatic or symptomatic. There is another term called initial orthostatic hypotension. It is defined as a decrease of more than 40 millimeter mercury systolic immediately on standing with rapid return to normal within 30 seconds. One should measure the BP in the supine posture, then ask the patient to get up, stand without removing the cuff. cuff. It should be repeated at one minute and at three minutes. An additional measurement should be taken if the patient is symptomatic. Pseudo-hypertension is intra-arterially, the pressure is normal. But in direct record, pressure is elevated. It is elderly patients with chronic kidney disease or diabetes, they are more predisposed. It is more common in men and hypertensives, those who had a history of stroke. Uh, Ostler's test, that is, inflate the cuff to, the, to occlude, the, occlude the artery, and you can roll the brachial or the radial artery even when the cuff is inflated. 
that is a test often done, but it has a low sensitivity and specificity. If it is suspected, it is better to confirm it by intra-arterial record. Few special scenarios. In the elderly, they are predisposed to white coat hypertension, isolated systolic, pseudo-hypertension and postural hypotension. In pregnancy, two points to be discussed. One is uh, a left lateral recumbency can be, is a reasonable alternative to supine or sit up posture. And Korotkov sounds phase five should be taken until and unless one can hear the sounds right up to zero. In that case, phase, uh, Korotkov's fourth phase uh, sound should be considered. In obese, larger cups are often required, very long cuff may be required, but if the patient is very obese, in that case, the cuff may be applied over the forearm and the radial artery may be palpated and auscultated at the wrist. Arrhythmia can often produce some error in uh, blood pressure measurement. Bradycardia, if severe, can cause some error. Here, the clue is one needs to deflate more slowly. The rate of deflation is 2 to 3 millimeter per second. That is normal. In this case, it should be 2 to 3 millimeter per, per bit. That means the rate of deflation should be slower. Another one is atrial fibrillation, where we often get wrong records of blood pressure because of the variation of the stroke volume. Here, what should be done is multiple readings should be taken, and it should be averaged. While measuring an individual reading, one should ignore an occasional correct cup sounds, and one should concentrate on the point where the successive correct cup sounds are hard. A multiple reading and the mean minimizes the error. So to conclude, accurate measurement of blood pressure is essential to classify individuals, to ascertain blood pressure related risk and to guide management. Regulatory agencies should establish standards to ensure the use of validated devices, routine calibration of equipment and training and retraining of the manual observers. Use of automated devices does not eliminate all major sources of human error. The training of observers should be required even when automated devices are used. Mercury manometer is still the gold standard. Thank you very much for a patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Goa. I think the basics are most essential at any level of practice and any level of clinical understanding. I'm sure it must have put to rest a lot of disturbances in mind regarding how to measure accurately a blood pressure, but I'm sure still this might have brought forth many further questions. I think I anticipate a lot of questions to Dr. Goa. Yeah, please. Uh, if it is not damaged, you can keep it. Uh, problem is, uh, there are two components. One is the inflation devices and all. That need to be changed because there will be cracks on the uh, rubber tubing. There may be leak in the valves and other things. But the mercury column per se, if it is not broken, it can be used lifelong. Dr. Guha. I need to ask you now, the mercury instrument, I agree with the tubings and the cuff, but regarding the calibration, how frequently needs to be done in servicing of the column? Uh, it is mentioned that unless it has been contaminated by something inadvertently, you need not do anything. That is because there are the two ways, two reasons why it can be damaged. One is if you use a glass tube that can be broken, there may be some small fry leaks that can contaminate the thing. But otherwise, you are directly seeing the column of mercury. If it is not contaminated, you need not validate it. Sometimes while inflating, a fragmentation occurs. Fragmentation, that is because air gets in. So that needs to be recalibrated again. That has to be put, put back in another one and that has to be recalibrated. Yes, definitely. But in hybrid uh, sphygmomanometer, Every time you record BP, there is a recalibration, which is the best solution. Sorry? In hybrid spigma manometer, what you are talking, there is always hybrid. a recalibration. Hybrid one, yeah. Huh. Every time you record BP, there will be first zero, 
and then only you will get the beat. That is the whole problem. You have to calibrate and validate it almost each time you use it, but particularly it, the electronic devices. But it does automatically. Yeah. So you don't have to do it. You but that whether that validation is proper, that need, needs to be checked again. <laughs> it is a non-market he is talking about. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah, please come forward. Our own, our own mercury, uh, yeah, exactly. That is, I have shown you one term, one picture, one slide using a white tube. You put one end with the, uh, say, aneroid, at the other end with the mercury, and you inflate the cuff. See, fix it at different levels. That has to be fixed at different levels. That is the that's, there's the AMI protocol. At different levels, you have to fix it. Say, at 100, at 200, you have fixed it. The Merc aneroid is reading 201, that is well, acceptable. But if the aneroid reads 204, that should not be used. That is, the percentage of margin of error should be plus minus 3. It should not exceed that. At different level, you have to do that and validate. Thank you, Dr. Guha. I'm sure. Mercury 1, we, we will use aneroid as baseline for calibrating the mercury sphygmomanometer. No, 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 no. The so other how way. to calibrate the, our standard one? Mercury? Yeah. Mercury, the, usually do not, that's what uh, the honorable chairperson was asking me, it usually do not require any calibration until and unless it has been damaged or contaminated. In that case, you have to calibrate it, comparing it with another mercury man, sphygmomanometer. Thank you, Dr. Guha. It has been an interesting exposure to the basics of taking blood pressure. Thank you very much.